Thank you. Well, welcome to the Richard Nixon Foundation Library Museum. My name is Bill Barabalt, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to a very special event this morning. We have some visitors that we'd like to recognize. Uh, former Congressman Duncan Hunter of San Diego, if you'd stand, please. Gene Hernandez, Mayor of Yorba Linda. And a new individual with the uh, National Archives and on behalf of the library, Mike Elsey, the, direction, the director of the Nixon Library. And, and this is the type of event that, uh, with the partnership between the foundation and, and the National Archives, uh, it's exciting for both of us to be participating and supporting an event like this. I'd like to recognize Lois Lundberg, Chairman Emeritus of the Republican Party of Orange County. And, and next, Hubert Perry, who's Chairman Emeritus of the Nixon Foundation and a longtime friend of Richard Nixon himself. Mr. Perry played football with the president at Whittier College. And Ruth Shannon, a longtime supporter and friend of the Richard Nixon Foundation. <laughs> to introduce our guest this morning, we're fortunate to have Fred Whitaker, who's the mayor pro tem of the city of Orange. He's an accomplished lawyer, and he's the newly elected chairman of the Republican Party of Orange County. Thank you, Bill. On behalf of the Republican Party of Orange County, it's my honor to welcome you to our county. It's my honor to be here with my former chairman, Lois Lundberg. There's only been four of us in 40 years, and she's built a great foundation for our party. You know, in an age where the president dissembles and equivocates and creates dissension instead of leads, we need to have leaders who believe again in limited government, a strong defense, and moral clarity but they do so in a manner that is gracious and respectful of others, that persuades and leads our country and brings them back together. And so I'm honored today to introduce our speaker who I believe will just do that, the 44th governor of Arkansas and possibly the next president of the United States, Governor Mike Huckabee. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let me say first of all, thanks for uh, the phenomenal welcome I had here this morning and uh, your rousing applause and ovation. And that was before the speech. <laughs> Smart speaker would quit now and say, I got there and got a standing ovation at the Nixon Library. <laughs> Now, if you're all gone by the time I finish, I'll know that it did not end as well as it started. So uh, I, I want to pay tribute to this magnificent band that has been entertaining us. Thank you, guys. When I was listening to them backstage, I thought, where do they get this band? It's a, like a professional band that must be, you know, California's filled with musicians. And I found out they were from one of the local high schools. And I thought, uh, I don't know what your future is, but I hope it's music, because you guys are good. I'm telling you right now. Thank you. Let me also say how much uh, pleasure I get from coming to the Nixon Library. I've been here on several occasions. I've had the privilege of going to most all of the presidential libraries across the country. I say this, and I say it with genuine sincerity, and I, I, I know it's going to sound like, oh, you're just kissing up because you're at the library here today. All of the libraries that honor our presidents are extraordinary, every one of them. And it doesn't matter whether it's a Democratic president or a Republican president, it's a wonderful insight into that particular piece of American history 
And that president's impact on it, and every president has had a remarkable impact on our lives. And I enjoyed the visits to every one of them. Each have their qualities and their nuances. But one of the things that I love about this library, and again, the staff at all the libraries, top notch. But I say this, that every time I come to the Nixon Library, the one thing that just overwhelms me is the extraordinary professionalism, the courtesy, the hospitality of the docents and volunteers at the Nixon Library. They absolutely are fantastic. Thank you. And may I just say that I really like this podium. I think it's uh, so. I think a fellow could, uh, could get used to a podium like this, but that's another discussion for another day. I don't think I would be disingenuous nor dishonest if I told you that our country is in a world of real hurt. And I don't think I would be disingenuous or dishonest if I told you that our world is in a moment of great turmoil and conflict. We're facing serious dangers. And we're facing some real challenges at home on the domestic front. I, I was just the other day in Palo Alto. I spoke to a group of Republican activists. And as I was uh, talking to them at breakfast, we had a gentleman who was serving us at the hotel where we were meeting. His name was Jose. I met him. I talked to him. And as we began the meeting, he had finished pouring coffee for everyone, and, and he left. It was just those of us who were there for, for the meeting. And I asked the group, I said, how many of you think the economy is in recovery? Most of these are Silicon Valley guys, and most of them said, yeah, seems to be. Things are seeming to be on the upswing. I said, well, how many of you think that Jose's economy, the guy who just poured our coffee, how many of you think his economy is in recovery? They kind of looked at me like, well, gee, I never thought about that. I said, think about that, because there are a lot more Jose's than there are guys like us. And we weren't very far. Uh, in fact, we were, I guess, a little north of Palo Alto and just south of the San Francisco airport. You could see the runway off in the distance. And I said, look over there and see those runways. I said, somewhere over there, there are guys lifting heavy bags that people overpacked. Some of folks like you, who when they travel, feel they have to take everything with them. And I said, they're lifting heavy bags and pitching them up on those conveyor belts. I said, I wonder if their economy is in recovery. Because I said, I tell you, if we went over there and asked them, they'd probably tell you that they are working harder right now than they've ever worked in their lives, and they have less to show for it. And that is true for many Americans today. People who are heaving, huffing, and puffing, coming home every day, having sweated through their clothes, with their wives telling them, you get a shower before you come to the dinner table. They're tired. Some of them, that's just one of two jobs that they're working. And it's not that they aren't working hard. I, I just, I get upset when I hear people say, well, Americans just aren't willing to work hard. Well, then you don't know as many Americans as I must know, because I know some that are working really hard. But they feel like that what once was the American dream is getting away from them. I hear people talk today about what is it that we need, not only in the next election, but in the next generation. And I believe it's more than anything, it's an understanding that beyond just changing and tinkering with the tax policies and tinkering with domestic policies, it's about giving Americans something to believe in again, giving Americans hope again. And by that, not the false hope that just gives us a rah-rah, but nothing substantive behind it, but giving us that understanding that the American dream is alive and well. And I'm going to speak to that this morning because for me, the American dream is very real, very much alive. One of the reasons that I, I feel uh, somewhat of a kinship to the life of Richard Nixon in his early days is because like Richard Nixon, I grew up not blue blood, but blue collar. 
You're looking at a guy who is the first male in his entire family lineage that ever graduated from high school. My dad didn't graduate from high school, grew up poor in South Arkansas. My mother uh, grew up during the Depression, as did my father. My mother grew up in a house where there was no electricity, no indoor plumbing, and the floors were made of dirt. Not nice flooring like you see here. My dad didn't finish high school, and his dad didn't, and his dad didn't, and his dad didn't. And as far as one can look up the ancestry, no male upstream for me ever finished high school, much less went to college. You know, my dad used to tell me, he said, son, don't look very far up your family tree, because son, there's stuff up there you don't need to see. <laughs> of course, that made me curious, and I had to go looking and found out the old man's right. There's stuff up there I don't need to see. I never thought in my lifetime I would see with my own eyes, even at a great distance, an American president. Why, that, that wasn't going to be possible for a kid like me. I never thought I'd saw, see ever in my life salt water. That just was not something that I could conceive. I never thought I'd fly on an airplane. Last year, on Delta Airlines alone, I flew 369,000 miles one year on one airline. I think I'm making up for that. I... So when people talk about the American dream, for me, this is not something that is abstract. It's not something that I've read about. I have lived it. I have lived it. And I love this country because I know where I started. And I know that because I grew up in America, I didn't have to stop where I started. And there are many places on this planet that wherever a kid begins, that's where he's going to be stuck for the rest of his life. The worst thing that can happen to America, and there are many bad things that could and are happening to America, the single worst thing that could happen to this country is that my grandkids would grow up not believing that the American dream is alive and well and somehow achievable for them. And the American dream means that not only are we a country that has access to prosperity by hard work and a decent education and by the sweat of our brow, but it's also a place where there is freedom, where we embrace and we live in the power of liberty, where we can speak as we think, we can worship as we please, we can not worship if we please. We will not be arrested for it. We will not be put out of business for it. We will not be shunned from society as a result of it. We won't be shot for it. There are not many places on earth where that has historically been the case. Tragically, if we are not careful, we will lose some of the fundamental liberties, and especially in religious liberty, where our beliefs will cost us our jobs, our livelihoods, our ability to make a simple living. And this ought to scare the daylights out of every American who embraces, loves, and wishes to not only have liberty, but to preserve it and to pass it on to the next generation. When I was eight years old, my dad took me to uh, hear a speech by the then governor of Arkansas. I'll never forget, he told me, he said, now, son, we're going to go down tomorrow. Governor of the state's coming to our town, which was stuck down in the southwest corner of the state. Governors rarely came to where we were. And he said, now, son, I'm going to take you down there and hear the governor. He's going to make a talk. They're going to dedicate this lake. I want you to go down there and hear it. He said, now, son, the reason is is because you may live your whole life. And you may never see a governor in person. <laughs> you know, it was inconceivable for him to think that one day his son would become the 44th governor of the state of Arkansas. And that I actually competed. <laughs> and that I actually competed and came in second in the Republican primary in 2008 in an attempt to become the 44th president of the United States. I thought that would have been really cool. <laughs> I would have also been the second president to have been born in Hope, Arkansas, a town of 8,000 people. I thought that would have been cool, too. And I thought the perfect slogan was, give hope one more chance. <laughs> So maybe I'll have to settle for hoping to be the 45th president of the United States and 44th governor, but we'll see how that turns out if, in fact, it should happen. 
Now, I tell you that because I grew up in, a, in an era in which we believed that this country could do anything. I mean, we really did. I remember John F. Kennedy saying, we're going to send a man to the moon and we're going to bring him back within the decade. He did not live to see it, but President Nixon in July of 1969 made the phone call to Neil Armstrong after Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, walked on the surface of the moon. I sat there and watched on the black and white television in my parents' family room and sat there on the floor mesmerized as a kid who had grown up through the Mercury, the Gemini, and then the Apollo space programs and realized my country can do anything. And we can put a man on the moon and we can bring him back. And today, the cell phone, the smartphone that you have in your pocket would never have happened had we not had that space program. The technology that saved some of your lives in here when you went to the hospital and were treated with exotic electronic equipment would never have happened had it not been, not because just that we went to the moon, but because the technology that we developed in order to do great things and bold things and unusual things was the technology that created an economy and created the sense of dream that had never existed anywhere in the world before. When we lose that sense of imagination, that sense of purpose, that dedication to the unthinkable, to that which has never been done before, we lose more than product development. We lose that spark within us as Americans that is always made for us the ability to say truthfully that we are the greatest nation on God's green earth. And I don't want to lose that. I want to see us once again be that stable, proud, capable nation. I know that many people will only remember the Nixon years of presidency for the final chapter, and that's unfortunate. Because I remember when he took office after the tumultuous 1968 summer, the summer in which I became a teenager, the summer that saw the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, that had seen earlier that spring the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., that saw riots in our street, people burning down their own neighborhoods and the very stores from which they bought their groceries, for heaven's sakes. When our college campuses became not the center of learning, but the center of protest, and often the president's office of a university was not where students went to see if they could get a scholarship, but where they would go to chain themselves to the door of the desk so they could protest policies they didn't like. Times were so bad that an incumbent president said he wouldn't even run for re-election. And at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago of the summer of 1978, as the hippies and the yippies were yelling, the whole world's watching, and many of them were having their skulls cracked because they were speaking out, we looked at that and we said, a country that's burning itself down, that has lost hope in itself, that has given up on itself. A country like this cannot survive. We were embroiled in a war in Southeast Asia that was being carried out in such a way that even people who believed in our military and believed in our effort weren't sure that we could extricate ourselves from honorably or successfully. And it took strong leadership. And Richard Nixon said that we will bring law and order to our domestic front, and that we will be a nation where there is peace through strength, and we will once again be respected in the world. Now today we face in many ways a similar comparable climate. Domestically we are incredibly divided and polarized, and it's tragic. Internationally our friends no longer trust us, our enemies no longer fear us. I have good friends who are Democrats, I know that'll be hard for some of you to believe, but I really do. I actually don't believe that Democrats are wrong all the time or that Republicans are right all the time. I think Democrats are wrong most of the time, but <laughs> not all the time. I was just able to identify the Democrats in the room. <laughs> Lighten up. 
Now, the fact is we are polarized today. And in this environment in which we are now embroiled, I know that there are people who are thinking that America's greatest days can only be seen from the rearview mirror looking back. And I refuse to accept that. I, I just believe that this is a resilient, strong country who, if it once again will find its soul, its purpose, its spark, that from which its strength once came, will once again be able, like we have in the past, to overcome this funk, this malaise, and find our sea legs again, and stand tall, proud, prosperous, capable, and give something better to the generation coming after us. And folks, if there's any one thing that I owe to my kids, but especially to my grandkids, I've got four of them now, soon to be five in June. And I've discovered, as many of you have, that the best thing about having kids is that one day they might give you grandkids. <laughs> I've decided that I can tolerate the teenage years of my children, now that they're all in their 30s. <laughs> I can tolerate it because one day they give me grandkids. I will tell you this, I thought it would never happen. I started to be worried. I would watch they got married, living their lives, all out of college. Great moment of parents' life, but I kept thinking, you know, some of my friends are having grandkids. I don't have any. And I would suggest maybe that. <laughs> and they never took that all that well. And finally, I just said to my daughter-in-law, she and my son had been married five years, I said, look, I don't care about your biological clock, but mine is ticking. <laughs> And so, I guess they got the message, and now I have four all, and, and when the fifth one comes in June, all of them, all five of them will be under the age of four. <laughs> Pray for my wife and me. <laughs> I want for them the America that I have grown up and loved. It's not been easy to see this nation get where it is. But I do understand something of how we came to be. What I'm about to say would not have been considered the least bit controversial but a few years ago, not even the least. In fact, every president until recently would have said these very words and no one would have questioned, no one would have ridiculed, no one would have held these words in contempt. Let me say them today and watch. I I'm almost can promise you that the coverage of these words will result in scorn. Here's the words. This nation can only be explained in terms of the providence of Almighty God. There is no other explanation for America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And when John F. Kennedy said that, Bill Clinton said that, Franklin D. Roosevelt said that, Harry Truman said that, nobody would have flinched. And I long for the day when Americans no longer flinch when they hear that the genius, the brilliance, the heart, the soul, the essence of this country is that when our founders created our liberty and they broke forward from the mother country and unshackled themselves from the tyranny of Great Britain, they said so with these words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are still good words for us today. I got involved in politics a little over a quarter of a century ago, and I, I honestly, like most people who get into politics, I'm sure Congressman Duncan and the mayor and others here who are involved could tell you the same thing. We got in because of conviction, believing there was something that maybe we could do, 
We probably had no idea what we were about to get into. People have asked me, what's it like running for president? I said, oh, it's a lot like sticking your face in the blades of a fast-moving fan. <laughs> if you can still recognize yourself after the ordeal, then you're most fortunate. When I first got involved in politics back uh, in the early 90s and ran for office, uh, I, I ran against a pretty, well, I would say a formidable wall called the Clinton political machine of Arkansas. I realize a lot of people have no idea what the climate of Arkansas was politically in the early 1990s and throughout the 90s. But if I were to ask you this question, which state in America do you think was the most democratic and the bluest state in all of the country during the 1990s? Most of you would say, oh, probably Massachusetts, maybe Vermont, Maine, Oregon, or California. <laughs> but you would be wrong because the bluest, most democratic state in all of the country was in fact Arkansas. When I was elected in 1993 to the office of Lieutenant Governor, I was only the fourth Republican elected to a statewide office in 150 years. Well, that was the reaction in Arkansas at the same time too. <laughs> I was elected because of Bill Clinton's ascendancy to the presidency. I was elected under uh, really tough circumstances because my opponent was his hand-picked candidate, his former chief legal counsel in the governor's office, and nobody thought that an upstart Republican could win a race when no one had won a race as a Republican in a long time. And when I slipped up and won, uh, again, against all of the machinery and all of the money that the Clinton organization had put into that race, um, let's just say this, the machinery wasn't all that happy. So when I got to the Capitol to assume office and to take the oath, my office door, the office of the lieutenant governor, was nailed shut <laughs> from the inside, and I'm not making this up. Some of you are thinking this is some hyperbolic, apocryphal story. It is not. Wall Street Journal flew John Fund, who was writing for them at the time, flew him down to Little Rock to see was in fact this true, or was this an exaggerated folk tale from the South? And he reported back that yes, there are physical nails in the door. And that door was nailed shut and remained that way for 59 days. On my 60th day as lieutenant governor, I finally was able to open the door. And when I got there, I found out that all of the office furniture had been removed. And the budget had been zeroed out. And I couldn't get letterhead printed because the state agency responsible for that just couldn't locate the order for that and never could find it. Some of you are wondering, how could they get away with that? My, my answer is, who could stop them? When you only have one party in power, it's kind of like the old days of the Soviets. Except the Soviets were much kinder about it than uh, <laughs> they were. No, it was, it was an incredible experience. I, I hear sometimes people say, is it possible for us to you know, overcome the possibility of a Hillary Clinton political victory? Well, I've got a little experience at that, and I can tell you it ain't easy. They play to win. But I also tell you that I've, every race I ever ran was against their machinery, their money, and in fact them. They came back and personally campaigned for every opponent I ever had, every one of them. Pretty intimidating to have the president first lady come back and campaign for your opponent. I, I will say, and I've always had an excellent relationship with the Clintons personally, remain cordial to this day. Uh, as Michael Corleone once said, <laughs> it's not personal, it's just business. I get that. So I've never been bitter about it, never misunderstood it. But I also understand that we face extraordinary challenges. Now, people ask sometimes, how can you win when it appears that your party has no shot. Well, I, I want to explain to you, people thought that of being a Republican in Arkansas in the 1990s. And when I got to the Capitol, I was the only statewide elected Republican in the entire Capitol, none other, I was it. They were so happy to see me, I'd get in an elevator, people would get off, I'd walk down the <laughs> hall, people would turn the other way. Reelected in 1994, and then 1996, I'm down into the hall minding my own business, being lieutenant governor. The governor is a Democrat. He gets convicted of whitewater-related felonies, as was often the case for governors in Arkansas to uh, have convictions. 
when people ask a governor in Arkansas, how many terms did you serve? They would always say, office or prison, just to make sure that we understood. <laughs> Five most feared words of an Arkansas politician with ease. Will the defendant please rise? <laughs> so he's convicted, he has to leave. I step into office and I take office July 1996. My legislature, consist of 89 Democrats and 11 Republicans in the House, 31 Democrats and four Republicans in the Senate, and half of those Republicans were suspect at best. <laughs> That's why I say it was the most lopsided legislature. Our entire congressional delegation, except for one congressman in the northwest corner of the state, all the rest of them, both senators, all of them Democrats. 94% of all the elected officials in the state of the county and local elected uh, official offices, all Democrats. Not another Republican in the Capitol but me in a statewide office. It was a lovely environment. <laughs> but I never got in 10 and a half years less than 90% of my legislative package passed. Now here's what I want to say to, and why I brought all this together. You see, I hear people say that our country is so totally polarized, divided, dysfunctional, that it never can again work as a country, and I disagree. Because I do understand this, that one of the reasons we are as dysfunctional, as divided, is because so many times people run for office, get elected, and they serve with the view that everything is horizontal. I mean, most political practitioners, and I've been one of them, but most everybody sees things if you're in the middle of the political world, and, and frankly, let's face it, most of you probably wouldn't be here if you weren't really keen on political activities, interest, and probably personally involved in some way. And, and I would say that most of this room, you probably think horizontally. You ask, are you liberal or cons uh, conservative? Are you Democrat or Republican? Are you left or are you right? And even among Republicans, we get into this uh, sometimes shouting match, and I'll use the word shouting because it's more appropriate than it would be to use other words. Um, we get into this shouting match about who is the most conservative. Well, he's not really a conservative. He's not as conservative as me. No, I'm more conservative than he is, and I'm even more conservative than all of you. And we argue on the basis of the horizontal. And, and look, I understand within our own little intimate family, maybe that makes sense to some people, but I'm gonna tell you something. While Democrats argue who's the left, and Republicans argue who's the right. A lot of Americans out there, people pouring coffee, lifting heavy things, going to work every day and sweating through their socks, they're not living in the horizontal world of left and right, liberal and conservative, Democrat and Republican. They're living in the vertical world of will we go up or will we go down? And I believe with all my heart the reason I got elected in a state where people like me didn't get elected, the reason I was able to serve and continue to get reelected, the reason that I was able to pass legislation, and the reason that by the time I left, I achieved 49% of the African American vote in my state and over 45% of the Hispanic vote in my state. And people say, well, Republicans don't get that vote. How did you? Because I ran and I governed vertically, not horizontally. And by that, I never made it an issue of was I the most conservative, although I was. By far the most conservative person in Arkansas governor at that time, by far. And able to pass things that were truly conservative, 94 tax cuts, pro-life legislation, making it so that families weren't punished for working, reforming welfare, taking half the people that were on the welfare rolls and moving them to work it's easy to take people off the roll. The hard, heavy lifting is to get them a job so that they don't need the welfare anymore. That's the important part of American economy. I don't want to just get people off of government dependency. I want them to be independent of the government where they don't have to have it. And that ought to be the Republican message. And the manner in which we do that is that we govern vertically. And if you want to know what that means, it doesn't mean you give up your core values, your principles, that you don't compromise away the things that you hold dear and believe most. It does not mean that. But it does mean this. It means that we take the wise, sage advice from one of the great political philosophers of our day, Mick Jagger. 
who so brilliantly sang, you can't always get what you want. <laughs> and my friend, this is true in marriage, as all of you can attest, who are still married. It is true in business, and it is true in politics. And America today needs to come together and focus on what makes us a great country rather than just what makes the other party unacceptable in their ideas and plans. That's what America has to do. And in part, the reason I say that is because we can ill afford to continue to fight among ourselves when the world is in so much trouble. We face real threats today to our national security. ISIS is unlike any enemy that we've ever faced. Radical jihadism is not simply another geopolitical force. If it were, we could define it. We would know where its flag flies. We would know the color of its uniforms. We would be able to identify it, locate it, attack it, destroy it, and we would be done. We are fighting something we've never really fought before, and that is not simply a geographical political force. We are fighting a radical ideology that is so irrational that there is no negotiation with it because when you are fighting people over a piece of land, you might be able to move the borders of the land and say, you have this, we have this, we shake hands, we're done. If you're fighting over power and who's going to be in the seats of power, you, you might negotiate who gets to sit where and you might be able to achieve some level of calm and peace. When you are fighting people who believe that their sole purpose for being on this planet is to kill everyone who does not subscribe to their radical, irrational philosophy and religious fanaticism, you cannot negotiate with it because there is nothing that they want other than to kill you. They don't want to work with you and reason with you. Growing up in South Arkansas, there were snakes, rattlesnakes. We had copperheads and cottonmouth water moccasins as well, but the one we feared a lot uh, was the rattlesnake. I feared all the snakes. I feared the grass snakes and the king snakes, and when people say, that's not a, that's not a dangerous snake, I said, they all are deadly to me. I don't want to get close enough to say, mm, what kind is this one? <laughs> I'm scared to death of them. But the one thing I did know about a rattlesnake is you don't try to understand why the rattlesnake wants to bite you. <laughs> you don't have a conversation and try to reason with a rattlesnake. <laughs> you certainly never feed or pet the rattlesnake. <laughs> For those of you who perhaps have uh, never lived in the rural parts of America, let me explain. When you see a rattlesnake, you take one of two things, a 410 shotgun or a very sharp bladed hoe, and you remove the head from the rattlesnake and you kill him before he bites you. And when we're dealing with irrational, fanatical, kill us before we kill them, we better take the military equivalent of the 410 shotgun or the hoe and put them to rest before they put us to rest. And anything less than that is dangerous. I'm not ready to give up in this country, and I hope you're not either. I'm not ready to believe that America is done. I refuse to accept that. And the reason I do is because of my grandkids, because I owe them something better than what they see right now. I'm so grateful I had parents who made great sacrifices so that I could have the life that I'm enjoying. Look, my dad worked hard. All he knew was heavy lifting. He knew that he would never be a prosperous, wealthy man. The little two-bedroom shotgun rent house that I lived in on 2nd Street in Hope, Arkansas was the best he could afford for most all of my growing up. I was never ashamed, and I'm not to this day ashamed of how my parents came up or how they raised me. If anything, I'm grateful to God because I know that what they did inspire me to believe in was that in America, I didn't have to stay there for the rest of my life. I'd get a good education and work hard, Anything was, anything was possible. Because I've been given so much, 
as it says in the scripture, to whom much is given, much is required. There's an extraordinary requirement on those of us who are my age, older, and maybe not too much younger. We cannot accept leaving our kids and our grandkids what will be a $21 trillion debt by the time this administration leaves office at the current rate at which they're spending and borrowing money. We cannot afford to leave them in a place where America is a second-rate military power and in which the Chinese and other governments are building five ships to our one. We cannot continue <laughs> to see jobs that Americans could do and Americans could build things and make things disappear and go to some other government so their people can be prosperous and ours can be poor. It's time for Americans once again to prosper and Americans once again to stand tall and to be able to give their children and the generations after them a better life than the one they have lived. And that's why, hopefully, we're here today, hopefully why we refuse to accept anything less than that. And if I ever needed a reminder of it, it happened in the most unlikely place just last evening. I was on the Bill Maher show, and I was, uh, I can see you're all fans. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to surprise you. I, I don't agree with, well, anything, uh, Bill. <laughs> well, not much of what Bill Maher uh, believes, but, you know, I, I respect that Bill Maher has got the courage of his convictions, and he says it clearly and plainly. Thank God we live in America, and he can say whatever he wants. I celebrate that for Bill Maher. I celebrate it for me. I don't want people to shut him down any more than I want them to shut me or you down. But I've done his show many times, and he's actually treated me respectfully, and for that, I'm grateful. But it was not on the show. It was on the way to the show, because the driver that they sent to pick me up and take me over to the studio uh, was a gentleman, and I got to chatting with him, and I asked him his name. His name is Dimitri. I said, well, Dimitri, tell me, you, you have an accent. Where are you from? He said, I left the Soviet Union in 1988. I said, wow, one year before all the wall came down. He said, yes. I said, why'd you leave? He said, because I had a little daughter. And I didn't want her to live under the oppression. He said, the government lied to us. The government kept things from us. They never told us the truth. They told us that America was a horrible place, and they would show us pictures of the worst things happening in America and say, this is it. This is America for you. It's a decadent place. That's all it is. And he said, I knew there had to be a better life than to go to a store with nothing on the shelves, to jobs that didn't pay anything, that I was always indebted to the government, that I couldn't say what I wanted to say, think what I wanted to say. And I asked him, I said, well, tell me about your experience in America. Here's what he told me. He said, it makes me angry when people here don't appreciate what they have. He said, it makes me angry that they do not understand the opportunities. And I asked him about that little girl. I said, where is she now? She's in her 30s. She's now a registered nurse. She is raising her own family and successful. And I thought, you know, this is the America that we have built. This is the America that we love. The America where a guy named Dimitri who comes with nothing, nothing, nothing whatsoever in his pocket and he abandons his home country because he believes there's got to be a better place somewhere on this earth and he shows up here and he finds something better and he's able to give his daughter something different than she would have had had she continued to live in the old Soviet Union and even now Russia. And if it takes a Dimitri, somebody who wasn't born here, to explain to us what a great country this is, I told him when I left him yesterday, I shook his hand and I said, Dimitri, I wish we had you on television. I wish you were talking to America. He said, I don't talk so good. I said, you talk great. You talk better than most of the people we've elected to Congress and the people we've put in the White House. You speak the truth. And I say, let's keep America strong, safe, secure, and always a nation that has a better future than even it has a past. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I will now take some questions, and I really am grateful for your attention. Thank you very, very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much. We have some folks with microphones, and uh, we'll just go around the room. If you raise your hand, we'll uh, take questions. Yes, sir. We're going to start right here. Uh, I do really appreciate what you've been saying, and uh, especially about the American dream. Uh, it, it really saddens me to see the, the people lose their faith in it, but um, I have faith in God, I have faith in America, and I have faith in the American dream, and so uh, I really appreciate what you've been saying. My question for you is, um, what do you think is the, a couple of the most important things that the president, whether President Obama or you, could do to restore the American dream and the people's faith in the American dream? Great question, and how glad I am to see a young person who believes in America, and I'm delighted to hear that, that you've not given up. One of the things that we need to do to restore the American dream is to quit punishing people for their productivity. When we have a tax system that essentially punishes you for working hard, punishes you for savings, punishes you for making an investment, punishes you because you wanted to leave some seed corn for the next generation, that's irrational. It's counterintuitive to how you build a great economy. You shouldn't punish productivity and then, on the other hand, reward irresponsibility. And let me be very clear. The current tax code punishes people who want to get ahead. And unless you think I'm talking about the 1%, the, the top, no, they're going to be fine. You know why? Because they're going to have enough accountants and lawyers. They'll figure it out. They'll be okay. Don't worry about them. I, I like them. I wish they would write big checks to me, but I, I don't worry about them. <laughs> but here's who I worry about. I worry about the guy that I met in New Hampshire who was a uh, guy at a machine shop working, high school education. He told me that his daughter was going to Cornell grad school and that that was costing 50000 bucks a year which I was grateful my daughter didn't want to go to Cornell grad school. <laughs> and then he said, I want to help my daughter. I don't want her to have to go into big debt to get her master's degree. I want her to be able to live a better life than me. And so I said, I'll work two shifts. I'll work 16 hours a day instead of eight. He said, because I knew that if I worked 16 hours a day, I could take the second paycheck. I could give all of that to my daughter, help her finish her grad school without a big debt except when he got his first paycheck from 16 hours, thinking it would be twice as much as his eight-hour paycheck. It was barely the equivalent of 10 or 11 hours. And he couldn't figure out why until he went and said, hey, what happened here? They said, oh, well, uh, now you're in a new tax bracket. You see, I'm, I'm against the tax code, not because it's unfair to the people at the top. I'm an I'm a absolute believer we've got to transform it because it's totally unfair to the people at the bottom who want to move to the top. It's unfair to the guy who's working to double shift. That's who it's unfair to. And so if he's working double shift, he should get double pay. Most of us would say, well, yeah, that's fair. Well, it's not how it works today. And I'd like to see us pass the fair tax, which eliminates all the tax on our productivity. And it, it does something else that I think has become more important than it ever has before. It would get rid of the 16th Amendment and the IRS and put them out of our business. Uh, by the way, just simply put, fair tax is a tax on our consumption, not a tax on our productivity. So we would pay at the point at which we bought something rather than which we made something or produced something. And it seems to me that that's the way uh, that you should fund a government. Okay. Governor T. Wright? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Governor. Uh, thank you for coming out here today. Um, I think this place, uh, my question goes into a lot of what you've been saying about ending divisiveness and the diversity of our great country. Um, part of my inspiration coming out to see you today is I want to be the first person in America to meet both you and um, Ralph Bakshi in the same day. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He's the underground cartoonist directed Fritz the Cat. Uh, Wizards, Cool World. I just mentioned that because um, it's hard for me to imagine two people so far different from each other in the American culture. Um, and the question is that how do you reconcile the divisiveness, the cultural, how you or any president, President Obama, potential president, because it's not just about race or economics or any of that. America's a very divorced place. You'd have to be the president of, yeah, Republicans, Democrats, uh, independents, registered fascists. 
uh, religions, I mean, Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists, uh, Catholic Scientologists. So I'm just wondering, how does the commander-in-chief, the head of state, reconcile the diversity of this country? How do you be president of everyone? Well, the same way that I was governor of everyone in the state where there were fewer people like me than there were uh, affiliated with the other party. One of the blessings that came from being thrust into an environment that was as uh, uh, politically overwhelming as the one I faced in my state, the blessing was that I learned how to govern. I don't think you learn how to govern if everybody agrees with you. I, I sometimes longed to be like some of my governor peers who were governors in a state where they had super majorities in both their House and Senate, and if they came up and said, this is what we ought to do, their legislature, even if they didn't like it, said, okay, you're the governor, you're our leader, we'll do what you want. Uh, I had just the opposite. If I had a great idea and said, guys, let's do this, they'd say, we'll do anything but that. Here's what I learned, I learned how to govern. You know how you learn how to govern? Here's the first thing. You don't carry out the debate in the front page of the New York Times. If you, if you want to work with people, you don't poke their eyes out every time you get up at the podium and tell the rest of the country how horrible they are and then expect them to sit down and make nice with you and work towards something. So you suck it up and you let people say some nasty things about you and you just don't retaliate every time somebody says something. The second thing you do is you find out what it is the other side really, really wants. Some things you're not gonna be able to give them because it would violate your, your core values, your principles, the things that matter most to you. You just can't go there. You never start at the point of which you disagree. You start at the point at which you agree. And sometimes there are gonna be some real tough moments to find, how can I agree with this person? I mean, it may be that the only thing you can agree on is that you really both like Mexican food, and that's the beginning point of the whole discussion. <laughs> but you know, if that's where you start, you start at some point at which you agree, and you build relationship, you build trust. And that takes time, and it's tedious, and there's nothing pleasant or glamorous about it. The real art of governing is not that which anyone sees. It's done in the quiet, secret, private places of building relationships, having conversations, getting to know that person, that person's interest, that person's spouse, his or her children. It, it's, it's about building relationships. One thing that I've been most frustrated in watching President Obama, and I'll contrast him with Bill Clinton, who was excellent at this. President Obama has really not even built good relationships with the people of his own party. I've talked to friends of mine who are Democrats in the House and Senate. Yes, I have a few of those. <laughs> they won't admit it, but I will. And they say, I've never had a personal conversation with the president. He's never called me. He's never invited me to the White House. He's never invited me to fly on Air Force One when he comes to my state. Folks, you can't, you can't govern well if you don't have relationships with people. And you build relationships not only with the people who love you, but ones who don't. Because the only way that you're going to get enough votes to pass something is you've got to get them one at a time. Look, I'm, I'm going to give you a little secret about politics that I think a lot of people may be surprised here because people think it's real complicated. It isn't. It's a real simple process. It's, it's not algebra. It's first grade math. It's addition and subtraction. If you can count to 50, you can be successful in politics. Because when you get 50% plus one, you win. When you get minus 50%, you lose. It's a matter of saying, how many people do I have to choose from? All right, I gotta get in the House 218 votes. In the Senate, I gotta get 51, or in the case of cloture, I gotta get 60. It's math. You work until you get those votes. Until you get it, you don't put the piece of legislation on the floor. Just like a good defense attorney will tell you, you never ask a question in the courtroom unless you already know the answer. You never ask the question because you're looking for information. You might get information you don't want, it'll kill your client. You never put a piece of legislation on the floor that you don't have the votes for unless you're only doing it because you want to reveal how people are and sort of embarrass them to their constituents and make them vote differently. But I'm, I'm just saying that this is not that complicated. The complication is the tedious work of working with people and trying to find out what is it you want that I can perhaps help you have that doesn't take anything from me. And then when they give it to you, you don't ignore what they did. You congratulate them and you elevate them and you celebrate them in front of their peers so you make them successful. I'm going to give you one quick example. I know we've got to move on, but this is a, an important example, just a simple one. I had a highway bill that I needed to get passed in Arkansas. And uh, I, I needed the legislator's vote. 
I wanted this vote. I really needed it. And I went to him and I said, look, I need your vote. He said, I don't know. Man. I said, look, your people like highways. Going to help, help your district too? I don't know, man. I, uh. And he was very partisan. He didn't like me. And I wasn't that fond of him either, to be honest with you. Um, but he had told me before and told my staff that he had a, a farmer pal in his district in East Arkansas, where we raised a lot of rice and soybeans, that his pal, who'd been his good friend since the, like third grade or fourth grade, had always wanted to be on the soybean promotion board. Now, I'm sure those of you in Orange County are thinking, boy, that's what I'd like to be. <laughs> Hot dog, man. Uh, if I could be on the board that promotes soybeans, that'd be just awesome. But if you're a soybean farmer in East Arkansas, it's, you know, you, you're a pretty big deal among your fellow soybean farmers. And that's what his buddy wanted to be. So here's what I said to him. I said, look, I got an appointment coming up to the soybean board. You give me your vote on the highway bill, your buddy gets that seat. And I said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Instead of me calling him and telling him that I'm giving it to him, I'm going to have you call him and you tell him that you got it for him. In fact, I don't care what you tell him. You can tell him you beat it out of me. You can tell him <laughs> that you bargained magnificently, that you threatened it. I don't care. I need your vote on the highway bill, but I want you to get full credit for your pal getting on the soybean board because I know that'll make him feel like you're the greatest legislator down here. I said, that doesn't hurt me, but it hurts me if you don't help me on this highway bill. I got his vote, his buddy got the seat. That, my friend, is how you govern. It may not always be pretty, but it's how it works. Somebody else. Governor, right back yes. here, right in front of you, right in front of you. Yes, okay, here we go. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. First of all, thank you for loving America and thank you for loving Jesus the way you do. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that personally drives me nuts about the current administration is this, what is, appears to be this total disregard for our Constitution. And it seems to me, if it's truly being violated, which it seems it is, why do we have to wait it out? Isn't there something that can be done now to those who are, you know, violate our Constitution? Well, it's very frustrating, and all of you heard the question. Uh, I, I do think this president has um, been amazingly indifferent to the separation of powers that are fundamental in the Constitution, to the equality of the three branches of government, which is absolutely foundational to the survival of our republic. And, and I'm appalled as much as anything as I am by the lack of reaction, not only from members of Congress, but from the fourth estate, the media, who have allowed and sat by and blandly assumed that saying I have a pen and a phone is somehow more powerful than saying but I have a constitution and laws. When 22 times this president said he could not enact immigration reform without the authorization of Congress, that was 22 times he told the truth. May have been the only time, no, I think. But that's 22 times that he was, in fact, being honest and saying, I can't do that. Nothing changed in the law or the Constitution, and suddenly he did something that he 22 times said he couldn't do. And you know what is more surprising than the fact that he did it is that he's gotten away with it. And no one is holding him accountable, whether it's the people in Congress or whether it's the press, who's supposed to be the watchdog, not the lapdog, for the politicians. And it's very... Uh, Disgusting. And by the way, one of the things I would love to see us have, and I know it's controversial to some, we already have term limits on the executive branch, thank God. We also need term limits on the legislative and the judicial branch, all three branches of government. Yes, sir. Governor, this is our, our last question for the day. Okay. Better be a good one, it's the last one. <laughs> I'll try to make it, Governor. First of all, you are excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your Thank you. comments. And I have worked for President Reagan to all the presidents, and I have worked in the Republican campaigns for presidents. And as a Republican regent, member of the Republican regent, I have raised this question many times with at the RNC, as, where I serve as on the National Advisory Council. Why do we lose? out on semantics to Democrats. 
for example, mm. yeah. pro-life, pro-choice. I stood up in the Republican you know, regents meeting and I told the chairman, sir, why can't you use pro-choice, pro-life together? Pro-choice dash pro-life or pro-life dash pro-choice. We lose out on semantics. Yes. Can you please help us take care of that, sir? I totally if agree we are with like you. As president. And, and the question is, why do we allow the Democrats to beat us on semantics? In large measure, because we don't engage in that conversation. I was a debater in high school and college. And the first thing you learn on the debate team, and the first thing you learn if you're going to be a competitive debater is this, that before the debate happens, you define the terms. The de definition of the terms is the foundation of the debate. And until you agree on the definition of terms, you're not prepared to debate. If you don't have a mutual definition of terms, then if you allow the other side to dictate what those definitions are, you have already lost the debate and it hasn't even started. You might as well just sit down, you lose. And winning a debate starts with defining the terms. We have allowed Democrats to define terms and here's the sad thing for me, Republicans have often walked away from that battle and we've just allowed the definition to be theirs. If they say I'm anti-abortion, I say, oh no, I'm not. No, 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 you misunderstand. I'm not just pro-life, I'm pro-human. I believe that every human life has worth and dignity. I think that every human life is, has value. I don't think there's any such thing as a disposable or expendable human being. I think that the kid with Down syndrome is as valuable as the captain of the football team. I think that every child deserves that every child deserves protection. Do you not believe that? And I ask them to defend their position rather than allow them to put me on the defensive and have to defend mine. Every time we allow someone else to define the debate, we lose. But we lose because we don't even engage. So if somebody says we're engaged in a war on women, I say, no, we're not. We, we really do believe that, as the founder said, all of us are created equal and died by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Do you not believe that? Do you really believe that a woman is a helpless victim of her gender? And that if the government doesn't help her, prop her up and somehow salvage and save her, that she is not capable of making the same career, life, significant contribution that a male can make? Do you believe that? Because if you do, then I guess you have a much weaker view of a woman than I do. I'm married to one and have been for nearly 41 years. I've got a daughter and a daughter-in-law, and none of the women in my life close to me are anything like helpless victims. <laughs> Lord knows, married 41 years, I feel like the helpless victim sometimes. But they don't need me to stand tall. They don't need me to somehow make it so that they'll uh, get by. And, and I said, if you think that, then I guess the war on women is something you'll have to explain and, and define. But no, that's not a war on, it's a war for. And that's how, we need to stop allowing the other side to suck us into their terms. And yes, that is an excellent point and I appreciate the question. And I'm told that that's the end of them. I'll sign some books for you. Yes, sir? <laughs> uh, the question, am I here to announce a candidacy? The answer is no. Here's what I have said to everyone. Uh, I will make a, an announcement and or a decision sometime this spring. People say, well, it's spring. And I said, and it will be until June 21st. <laughs> but I will say this, as we say in television, stay tuned. Thank you very much. <laughs>